A rabbi is, among many other things, a teacher. Rav means teacher. And I'm hoping that I'll teach you something this morning that you didn't know. So um, how many of you think that you know the best way to cut a mango? Well, I have to say, my whole life I struggled. You know, you cut it and then you have to peel the skin away from each piece and you end up losing most of the mango. Anyway, so I was in Israel, as you know, with Deanna weeks ago, and I spoke about being in Israel and I spoke about all of the um, you know, complexity and the beauty there. And I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on one little thing I learned was from friends of ours that we stayed with in Ranana, and that is how best to cut a mango. It's absolute genius. If you knew this, I apologize for being obvious. My friend took out a lovely mango and she put a serrated peeler next to the mango. And so the first thing that you do is you take a serrated peeler and you get rid of the skin. And that's 90% of the effort. It happens so quickly. And then you can cut the rest of the mango and then you, you, know, you cut around the pit in the middle and then you stand over the sink and you eat the pit while nobody's watching. And that's it. So raise your hands if, if you didn't use a serrated peeler to cut a mango. Okay, you've learned something tonight after Shabbat, go on Amazon or whatever and get yourselves a serrated peeler. I hope that I have made your life a lot easier. Now, why have I shared this with you other than improving your mango consumption experience? I shared it because essential to what it is to be a human being and essential to our tradition is that we're constantly learning new things. And we are constantly changing the way that we move in the world. And that is really essential to the whole enterprise of Teshuva, which is taking a look at ourselves, trying to make changes, trying to see if we can do things differently. Interestingly, there is a piece of this morning's Torah reading, especially the way that it's been understood, which to me challenges the whole notion that human beings can change. And I'm speaking of a passage that we read, which has to do with the son, it didn't apply to daughters, who was known as Ben Sorer Umore, a son who was uh, rebellious and who did not listen, the stubborn and rebellious son. And the Torah tells us that the parents would try to discipline him, the Yisru Oto, and if that didn't work, then they would take him to the entrance of the city, and they would say, Benenu Zesero Morer, our son is stubborn and rebellious, Enenu Shomea, he doesn't listen to his father and his mother, Zolel Vesove, he is a glutton and a drunkard. And then the people of the city would actually impose capital punishment on this boy. They would put the boy to death. Very harsh and very, in many ways, disturbing. Now, the rabbis subsequently looked at this and they said, well, the mother and the father have to speak with one voice. Well, it really only applies on one day in the person's life, the day that the child reaches maturity. Um, well, you know, they, they have to um, have a certain kind of testimony. And ultimately, what they said was never should this be applied. Ben Sorero Morello Hayavalo Nivra, this stubborn and rebellious son, it never existed. Either it never existed um, in, in concept or it was never actually carried out. But here's a piece that's disturbing. I want to share it. And then I want to discuss what we can learn even from something disturbing. So the rabbis said, uh, how could you do something so harsh to this boy? I mean, what did he do? He ate too much. He drank too much. He didn't listen to his parents. I mean, my God, if we use that criteria, you know, um, imagine where it would take us. So what they said was, neherag al shame sofo that he is punished for what he was eventually going to do so that his eating and his drinking would lead to gambling and that might lead him to harm people and that might lead to murder. And so basically we remove him before he does harm. Now I have to tell you 
The reason why this is so remarkable is because it stands out. This is so different from every other aspect of Jewish tradition. And our ancestors understood that and they were uncomfortable with that. And so there's an expression that sometimes from the negative, you learn the positive. So what do we learn? Our tradition understands that people are constantly growing. A child is constantly growing. We know that a certain amount of rational thought um, it evolves. Children at a certain age, they're not capable of full rational thought. They are constantly growing. Adults are as well, but certainly children. And we talk so much about a crisis of mental health, about crisis of confidence that exists among children and teenagers and young adults. Our ancestors by and large understood that you have to treat that with compassion and that you have to regard everyone at every stage of life as constantly evolving and constantly developing, which is why the rabbi said this never really existed. We need to treat children especially, but all human beings as works in progress that are constantly evolving. So I want to put that out there, not just in terms of how we treat young people, but in terms of how we treat each other. You know, sometimes we say like, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm willing to give that person a chance to change. And then the person makes a change. And maybe we don't like that change. We're not always as kind as we need to be to each other to allow each other the space to evolve. So what I would urge us to do is two things. First of all, to support each other as we evolve, to support each other and say, you know, I understand you're not where you want to be. I understand you're going to try to make some changes within our own families to be kind and to be open to the evolution that each member of that family takes. And that includes friends and that includes the wider community. And lastly, to allow ourselves that capacity to learn new things and to do new things. God says to us, Ad yom motcha achakelo. I am waiting for you until your very last day. I am waiting for you to be the person that you are meant to be up to the very last moment of the last day. What I described to you was the exception which proves the rule. We are a tradition that understands and embraces our capacity for growth. And if I may leave us with the image from the beginning of our sermon, I hope that we will have the confidence to peel away the layers that exist within ourselves and to allow those layers to be peeled away in those whom we love. Shabbat Shalom.